Russia is pulling back its forces north of Ukraine's capital, but that has brought horror rather than relief, as indications of a civilian massacre come to light. The devastating images from the town of Bucha indicate that Putin's forces murdered hundreds of civilians before withdrawing. That's sparking new calls for harsher sanctions, including an embargo on Russian fossil fuels. So far, Germany's been resisting, fearing massive harm to an economy highly dependent on Russian gas. The predicament is prompting a new look at politicians who enabled that dependence. And we're asking, Russian war crimes, the end of German illusions? Welcome to To The Point. It's a pleasure to welcome our guests. Malta Leming is author and lead editor at the Berlin Daily Tagesspiegel. And it's a pleasure to welcome Matthew Karnichnik. He is chief Europe correspondent for Politico. And also glad to have with us Claudia Kempfert. She is head of the Department of Energy, Transportation and Environment at the German Institute for Economic Research. And I'd like to start by talking a little bit about what we think is happening on the ground. And Matthew, what's your interpretation of the Russian uh, troop pullback? What do you think Putin's next move could be? Well, it certainly looks like he's trying to regather his troop strength and reposition them in the east to um, kind of launch a new attack from the east and, and, and get what they can, because it was clear that they weren't going to succeed in in uh, surrounding Kiev and, and taking it over. So I think uh, they're, they're regrouping, as it were, and uh, it's something the Ukrainians are certainly worried about because they've been fighting Russia in the east, obviously, for the past, for the past eight years. Claudia, uh, Ukraine possesses the second largest gas reserves in Europe, and much of that is, in fact, in the eastern part of the country, leading some experts to conclude that Putin may well be looking to establish full control over those reserves. Is this war ultimately all about fossil fuels? Yeah, we are in the middle of a fossil fuel war, and that's for sure, because Russia has the largest reserves on oil, coal and uh, gas uh, on Earth. And also uh, there is an interest, clearly an interest, in also uh, having the gas or using or uh, exploring the gas uh, that is uh, located in the Ukraine. So for sure, there might be one reason. It's not the, the pure reason or the first reason, but there is a reason, and fossil fuel plays a key role in here. At any rate, the Russian reorientation of troops uh, has now allowed these images to come to light from the town of Butcha, images that appear to show that a civilian massacre occurred there. Malta, back in January, prior to the beginning of the war, you warned against Western weapons deliveries to Russia, saying they could cause Putin to take even harsher aggress aggressive um, uh, moves. Do you think that's what we're seeing here in these images from, from Butcher? No, things have changed. I mean, if you start a war, there's a different logic. So I, I would be in favor now of, of weapons delivery uh, to the Ukraine so that they can act in self-defense. Self-defense is something else than, than preparing for a war. In preparing for a war, you have different kind of logic. So what happens now, I think, is a, is a battle as well about fossil fuels, but about the Black Sea. I mean, we have a, the, the Crimean in the Black Sea, we have Odessa, we have Mariupol, all these, all these centers surrounding. And the Black Sea is so delicate because we have two NATO members, Bulgaria and Romania, with huge borders to the Black Sea. NATO could, have, uh, 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 could drive into the Black Sea, but then they will be confronting Russia. So uh, this will be a very, very delicate moment of, in, in the next weeks to come. We also uh, know, of course, that Russia has been laying siege to uh, Mariupol. Uh, we don't yet know the full extent of damage and, uh, and killings there. But, uh, Matthew, if you look at these images from Butcha, which, of course, are only possible because the Russian forces had withdrawn, how certain can we be, first of all, that it was Russia that committed these murders, and secondly, that this amounts to war crimes? Well, I think we have to start by saying that, you know, what war crimes are always very difficult to prove in court. But 
Uh, I think to any thinking person, we also, you know, have common sense. And if you look at the evidence there, if you look at the satellite images taken before the Russians left that the New York Times has studied and confirmed show the bodies were lying there on the street before the Russian troops left, I think it's pretty clear that, number one, war crimes were committed. There can be no doubt about that. And I would say it's very, very likely that the Russians are responsible for this. I don't think that any, you know, um, person who looks at the evidence objectively could come to to another conclusion at this stage. Whether that can be proved in court, of course, is is, is another matter. But I think that the West has to react to this, assuming that Russia is responsible. And I think that's what's what what's happening now. Although. You know, many Western governments still aren't willing to go as far as the Ukrainians would like, I think as the Americans would like in terms of imposing an embargo on Russian gas, for example, which is something that Germany, Austria, other countries in Europe are resisting. And let's, in fact, listen to what uh, the, uh, one Ukrainian has had to say after the images uh, emerged uh, from Bucha. Ukraine's president traveled there and delivered a ringing condemnation of what, in his view, amounts to European appeasement of Vladimir Putin. I invite Merkel and Sarkozy to visit Bucha and see what the policy of concessions to Russia has led to in 14 years, to see with your own eyes the tortured Ukrainians and Ukrainian women. Malta, noteworthy that President Zelensky named names there, named Chancellor Merkel, named President Macron. How is the German political elite reacting? Um... I, th I think some of them understood uh, what has happened and what kind of mistakes they made. It's the very, very few in the elite. I think um, a country that decides to phase out of nuclear energy and out of coal um, and is not able to, to be fast enough in building renewable energies like wind turbines and, and, and things like that, they need fossil fuels. They need the gas. And that's what they did for the last 15 years. By, by deciding to phase out of these things, you, you enhance the, the need for that and you enhance the dependency on gas things. So that's why, why Putin was, um, was financed by all these imports uh, and, his, and his military buildup was financed by Germany. So I think that is what Zelensky understands and what he's always pointing at uh, to say this has to change. But let me ask you this, if I may. Um, uh, Chancellor Merkel, Although, to some degree, she was also tough with Putin after 2014. She held Europe together on sanctions against Russia. On the other hand, she stuck with the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline right to the end. And she remains veiled in silence. She has not addressed right. uh, the reassessment of her legacy that many people are demanding. Yes, I mean, um, she was the one who decided after the, the earthquake in Fukushima uh, to speed up, uh, to go out from atomic from, from nuclear energy. So what is the result if you don't have enough? Right now, we, we still have just 40% of our energy coming from renewables. And if we speed that up, we will in very, very short time have the so-called NIMBY effect, not in my backyard, things that people will stand up and say, not in my backyards. I'm in principle, I'm in favor of renewables. I want to come back to that, but I'd like to stay with the reaction right now uh, to accusations like the ones that we heard from President Zelensky there. Claudia, I think you wanted to speak to yeah. that or to the energy issue? No, to the energy issue, because uh, in the same time when this happened also that what you said, that the increased uh, dependency on Russian gas, there has been barriers in step to reduce the share of renewable energy. We could have today a share of renewable energy of 80% if we would have not blocked this development. And that is, uh, you don't need gas. Gas was never a bridge technology. It's by purpose, and it has been a political reason why it happened in this way. So there is a clear reason why Nord Stream 2 um, has been established. There is a clear reason why we do not have a full energy transition yet, which we could have had if we would have been much faster. I, mean, deep, I, I really want to drill deeper on no, the energy it, in a moment. Depends, yeah. we but have... it depends on the, on the policy of yeah. both. Yeah. It depends on Merkel's but, policy. But maybe this, let, let's, yeah. The second part of the answer is our relationship to Russia. I mean, uh, Germany killed like 27 million inhabitants of Soviet Union, Russians, Belarusians, Ukrainians. During the Second World and, War. And during the Second World War. 
And they, ha they had the feeling that because unification, what they never believed in was possible because of the Soviet Russia, that unification with Russia, they owe something. I mean, we st still remember the Gorby Gorby uh, uh, enhancement when the wall came down, Gorbachev was meant, and the love of Gorbachev, the love of Russia, that they made it possible, uh, and forget that they even paid them for, for pulling back their troop with 18 billion marks to that German march at that time. Have you ever seen a country that was occupied and paying the occupier for, 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 going, for, for pulling back? That was the German relationship to Russia. And let me ask you, Matthew, because you recently, just a few days ago, wrote an article called Putin's Useful German Idiots, in which you said, uh, and I quote, uh, Putin's invasion of Ukraine is a repudiation of a whole generation of German politicians. Tell us why. Well, I think we're sort of seeing that play out here and with, with Merkel, Obviously, Gerhard Schroeder, who was one of the fathers of, of Nord Stream 2. Former German chancellor, Former who German actually Austrian even chancellor. now recently traveled to Moscow uh, to <laughs> redeem himself. <laughs> exactly. Nord Stream 1 and 2. Nord Stream 1 and 2, who went straight from the chancellery uh, a few weeks later, joined um, uh, the board of Nord Stream as its, as its chairman. Um, so I, I think if you, if you sort of stand back and look at this scenery in Germany, you can see that the major figures in both parties, it's not just one party, it's not just Schröder, it's not just the Social Democrats, it's the two dominant political blocs in Germany are complicit in this decision. And I would also argue that it goes beyond that even into the media establishment, especially in the, uh, the, the public media in, in Germany that also stood behind these policies. Uh, if, if you go and listen to the commentaries just from a couple of years ago, you heard people saying, well, we shouldn't be too hard on Russia. You know, the, the NATO is saber rattling, as now President Steinmeier said uh, back in 2018 when there was a NATO exercise in, in, in Eastern, Eastern Europe, 16. Uh, so, you know, you know these, are, these are all things that, that point to a kind of group think here that I think led us to this point. And I think that they're, they're, they're in shell shock now. All of these politicians don't know what to do, and I think this is the, the crisis, really, that Germany faces, because it can't lead at so this moment, because it's been discredited. Let me ask you Federal President uh, Frank-Walter Steinmeier has actually now admitted to having made grave, grave mistakes. Do you think the scales are finally falling from German eyes, and will it make a difference? Uh, unfortunately, I don't. And if you actually look at the text of what he said, he uses the plural a lot and says, you know, I, like many others. Uh, and, you know, if you, if, if, if you look at what he actually said, he's, he's essentially saying our strategy was right, but Putin didn't play along. <laughs> and, you know, Putin is really a bad person. Uh, whereas if you go back in time, you know, th this was very controversial internationally in Germany's relations with other countries. There were plenty of people outside of Germany saying, you can't trust Putin. Look at what he's done in Georgia. Look at what he's done in Syria. Look at what he's doing in Libya. This is not somebody that Germany should be getting into bed with. And it's worth remembering that the green light finally for Nord Stream 2 was given by Germany in 2015. That was right. after Crimea. That was after Putin started the wars in eastern Ukraine. And they still went along with it. So they went into this with sort of eyes wide open. And I don't think, you know, a few apologies here and there can really, um, you know, make up for what was done here. Because essentially, and this is what I argue in that piece, uh, Germany opened the door for this. They effectively encouraged Putin because he felt clearly that he wasn't going to suffer any repercussions from but Germany by doing this. It was also a strategy by Russia and it really um, made it. I mean, it's not. it was not only criticism from outside, but also inside. We always criticized it. And I remember also that a lot of politicians just laughed and said, well, you're wrong because we criticized from the energy point of view that we have huge geopolitical risks if we do it in that way. And they were just ignored. I mean, and laughed away. Let, let, us, let us take a deeper Maybe dive just, on... Just just one small footnote. We, we are all on Germany right now, and that's right to do it. And, and I'm very much in favor of blaming everybody in Germany for, for what they did with the energy policy. But it's not Germany to decide how far Putin is going and what kind of war he leads. There are so many more powers involved. We have the Budapest Memorandum uh, in 1994, when the Great Britain and USA gave, gave security, sovereignty uh, assurances to the Ukraine. Nobody's talking about that. So we have a lot of countries involved 
involved in this war. And in fact, the EU at the moment is now debating once again tougher sanctions on Russia in reaction to those devastating images from Butcha. For example, the idea of embargoing Russian fossil fuels is high on the agenda. Germany and a few other countries like Russia-friendly Hungary have been resisting a full embargo, at least until now. In Germany and in other European countries, entire industries have been kept running on Russian gas. There are plans to replace it with liquid natural gas terminals from the USA and other places, but this will take years. And an immediate suspension of Russian supplies would have devastating consequences, especially for the German economy. Hundreds of thousands of jobs would be put at risk. Entire industries would be jeopardized. The truth is that the sanctions that have now been adopted are already hitting many citizens hard, and by no means just at the gas pump. Supply chains for the automotive industry, among others, are already being disrupted. There is a shortage of fertilizer as well as raw materials like wheat, which are usually imported from Ukraine and Russia. All goods are becoming more expensive because of rising transportation costs, and inflation is rising as well. What price are Germans willing to pay for Ukraine? Matthew, even President Zelensky has indicated that he understands that Germany uh, that Germany can't go for a full embargo on gas overnight, as it were. But should Germany being, be doing more, and if so, what? I think it should definitely be doing more, and I, I think the question is is the wrong one. I don't think it's what should Germany be doing for Ukraine, because ultimately what they're doing is for security in Europe. And I think when you see these pictures, there is no other option from a moral perspective but to impose a gas embargo. And yes, that would be painful, and yes, that would tip Germany into a recession. But do you really want to sort of live with having funded Putin's aggression against Ukraine. And let's remember, there are hundreds of millions every day that are flowing into Russia for gas uh, from, from Germany. And, uh, you know, I, I just think it's, it's not going to be a legacy that uh, any German is going to be comfortable with if this war, as many people fear, uh, continues for, you know, possibly years. Malta, uh, cutting off funds for Russia's war machine, as it's uh, been called, is one of the reasons given uh, for uh, saying that Germany and the rest of Europe should go for a a tougher embargo. But another reason potentially could be that if Putin is in fact now planning to try to firm up his control over the East because of gas reserves, wouldn't an embargo send a a message to him saying it doesn't matter because we're not going to buy him? Uh, I think we have to differentiate between coal, uh, oil and gas. Coal and oil could in principle be substituted, just a question of money. There is an international market. Uh, there are d- different kind of ways to, to bring in coal and, and, and oil from other places. Gas is, is much more problematic because we are very much dependent right now still on gas. Um, I say if, if Germany would be willing, for example, to frack, uh, to use the fracking system, uh, we can produce uh, gas by ourselves in Germany. Uh, but there's a European ban on fracking because uh, right now we are, we are importing uh, fracked gas from the LNG, so-called liquid natural gas from the United States, which is the result of fracking. So we are not shy in taking these gas, but we are very much reluctant to do it Just by like ourselves. Just like Germany's not shy in taking nuclear power right. uh, produced right, by right. neighbors. Taken Claudia, from France. Let's go to the energy expert here with <laughs> two questions. Germany's new economy and climate minister, who is a member of the Green Party and certainly not responsible responsible for the predicament that the country finds itself in. He's been working tirelessly to try to begin weaning Germany off of fossil fuels, making deals in the United Arab Emirates and Qatar to get more liquefied natural gas, looking to reduce coal. Uh, He says that Germany can actually be off of coal and oil by the end of the year. So question would be, you have said you think Germany could do a full embargo, even including gas. How so? 
We did several studies, especially on the gas market. We don't have to frack, that's the good news. So we can import it also from other nations. Uh, liquefied natural gas, of course, is one option, and this is because we have uh, delayed the energy transition. And the new uh, economics minister, Green Party, one uh, needs to get uh, other sources from uh, gas all over the world. That's for sure. But we have enough gas on the international market. It's always a matter of price, and we compete here with Asian countries. But we can make it, and we should make it. I completely agree with Matthew. We should do it now, uh, because uh, it's it's uh, possible. And to avoid this negative economic impacts, we can also do a lot uh, by helping the economy, by helping also the chemical economy. We did that during the corona uh, time. So the government itself has it in its hand how to reduce the negative potential economic impacts. And this is why we have to, we, we did all the studies related to energy markets and it's feasible. We have to do it. Mother, how much hardship would the German people be willing to tolerate? Recently, The Economist said Europe and Germany are asking too little of their citizens, that if they would simply turn down the thermostat and drive their cars slower, we could reduce a lot of consumption of gas. Are the Germans willing to do that, or do they just want to keep in their complacent and comfortable world? It's very much the question, who is the actor? If, if Putin decides to put off, uh, uh, to, to pull by himself, stop uh, exporting gas, oil and coal to here, I think Germans will understand that they have just to suffer because what can they do if he decides upon? If Scholz, the Bundeskanzler, decides, the Chancellor decides to, to stop it, then it's something else because then it's their own decision. He made us uh, freezing in winter times or made uh, everything's more expensive and so on and so on. And I think this was, that was uh, fueling their own frustration, their tendency to frustration. What well, is, I mean, the whole discussion reminds me something of the late Donald Rumsfeld and his famous expression, there are known knowns and known unknowns and unknown unknowns. We just don't know what kind of effect an embargo has on the war he's, he's fighting right now. We have the moral obligation, I understand this completely and I share that a lot. We, and, but, and we st still don't know what the, what the implications would be for the German economy. You have your studies, the Chancellor has its own study by talking about mass unemployment and mass poverty. Matthew, when you hear Chancellor Schultz speaking to the Bundestag, as he did recently in a debate about uh, the budget, and outlining all the dr dramatic consequences that an embargo would have, he referred to it as being catastrophic. Is that the new leadership that many of us expected from Germany after his speech on February 27th, when he announced an epochal shift? Well, uh, quite frankly, no. And I, I think, you know, this is why looking back, this whole talk of this Zeitenwende, as they call it in Germany, this this shift, um, you know, I think we're going to have to look closely at that in a couple of months and see how far Germany is really willing to go. Also, in terms of military spending, this is already starting to be questioned by many in in in, in Berlin, in, in the political debates. Does Germany really want to spend $100 billion on defense now? Was this just sort of a knee-jerk reaction? Um, I think, though, that you know, the Germans hopefully will settle on a position that they won't regret five or ten years down the road as they are now regretting their position uh, towards Russia. Because quite frankly, I think that, yes, there are a lot of unknown unknowns. I don't think that a gas embargo is going to, you know, break Putin's will. It won't. But, you know, he'll find ways to sell that gas to the Chinese, to the Indians and others. But at least it will not be Europeans financing uh, this war. And I think it's worth remembering that Germans, Western Europeans live very comfortable lives. People are not willing to suffer, quite honestly. But I think, you know, it's worth looking at what's going on in Mariupol. What, look at the right. people coming out of those cellars and the stories they're telling. And I think, uh, you know, it's, it's time for a reality check. And Malta, let's come back to our title because it asks whether Russian war crimes, whether those pictures from Mariupol where we see uh, emaciated hands and arms reaching out uh, for bread that was being distributed after people came out of their cellars, will they change German minds? Our title asks us, Russian war crimes, uh, end of German illusions. I'm a little bit more optimistic than Matthew is. I, I think it changes a lot. We see these pictures and I think they're... Um, <laughs> 
if it comes Germany confronting their own past, they dealt with the uh, genocide, with genocidal intent, with things like this, and they always had, had the uh, saying that this gives us an obligation to stop it. And um, I think if you take, just take them by words, you can change their, their attitude towards uh, things that are happening on the ground. Claudia, um, in many ways, it now looks as if the period since 1989 uh, is ending and that we're seeing Germany and perhaps many others in Europe as well coming out of a kind of a bubble where people thought that uh, we were surrounded by friends and good commercial relations would ensure peace and security. Do you think we're going to see a new realpolitik, a new realism now in Germany, perhaps especially when it comes to energy? Well, I would hope so. I would say welcome to reality because a lot of experts, uh, also us, but many others have always warned against uh, especially this Russian policy related to the energy sector. So there are so many geopolitical risks related to this. So I would hope there will be a new realpolitik uh, related to the energy transition and move forward to increase the share of renewables and energy savings. Thank you very much. Thanks to all of you for being with us and thanks to our viewers for tuning in. See you soon.